Welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series, At Home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Hazel Carby, Charles C. and Dorothea S. Dilley Professor of African American Studies here at Yale. And I'm delighted today to welcome Helen Kamak to our program. Thank you. So, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> thrilled you're here, actually. So before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Please note that this program will be recorded. Your camera and your sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions for Helen and they will be answered at the end of the program. If you would like closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking on the icon on your navigation bar. Okay. And now uh, Yale has a land acknowledgement. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Porgusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquian speaking people have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. A land acknowledgement that in my opinion is totally inadequate, it's a, an empty gesture really for the sort of brutality of such settler colonialism, but that's another question. That's what Yale has written. So to a more interesting subject about Helen Kamak, um, there is actually a quite detailed biography of Helen on the website, and you will have seen that when you registered. So Helen Kamak is a British artist who works across moving image, photography, writing, poetry, performance, printmaking, and installation. She is interested in histories, in the question of authorship. She's a marvelous storyteller, and she is also interested in the excavation of unheard and excluded voices. She's often mapping her own work and found texts onto social and political situations. Her work makes extraordinary leaps between places, times, and contexts, forcing viewers to acknowledge very complex global relations and the inextricable connection between the individual and society. And we will talk about some of these things today. Kamak is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Turner Prize, in 2019 for The Long Note. That's a film and installation which examines the civil rights movement in Derry with a focus on the role of women, making connections between Irish civil rights and black civil rights. Her work has been shown in solo and group exhibitions internationally and Kamak lives and works in Brighton and in London. So to begin, I'd actually like to begin our conversation, Helen, with a clip from what I believe is your first film. It's a portrait of your father who was conscripted from Jamaica into the military. You speak directly to him in the film about what you remember about him and his ceramics that surrounded you as you grew up. So Malik, if we could see that clip first and then we'll talk about it. It's an Akapi. I have never heard that name anywhere else other than when I think about two ceramic pieces you made. They used to sit on a full and dusty chest of drawers, dustier each year and looking at each other with sometimes suspicion and sometimes warmth. 
I remember you made ceramics. You made them prolifically at one point when you were younger, living your life as a school teacher, often angry that you hadn't made more of yourself, often angry that you felt you weren't able to do more, be more, being able to be seen to be more, be seen to be able to do more. I remember, shopkeepers would avoid placing change in your hands, the anger. I remember, shopping in our local town, having moved to your dream of living in the countryside. Get back where you came from, and you said, we will not. Brave words, yet you would never leave this country for fear you wouldn't get back in again. I remember, you were a magistrate because you said there were too many inconsistencies in who appeared before court and who ended up incarcerated. I remember you wouldn't stand up for the national anthem at my school concert because you said it didn't signify anything worth being proud of. And I remember being relieved when my mum picked me up from parties because it made me seem less different from my friends. So, Helen, you tell a story of a life that is creative. It's about a person who refuses to bow, even though life is frustrated and frustrating in the UK. That beautiful phrase, not able to do more, be more, to be seen to be able to do more. And you also evoke the anger about the racism that limits possibilities that defines expectations of being and becoming for your father and for you. The film also reveals a haunting sense of failure and asks what is value, who and what are valued. And I really, also because, you know, I mean, my father came from Jamaica, right, and was also in the military, was also terrified that if he left the country, he wasn't gonna get in again. And you're telling a story which is relevant to so many people, but it's also really particular and very moving about two artists, about a particular man, your father, and your relation to him. So how did you manage to create, it has something to do with the, the camera movement, I think. Mm you have a sort of very partial view of a ceramic black and white animal, but you also move the camera incredibly slowly, revealing what we understand is in fact an answer to a question we haven't asked, except maybe we've asked it in our head because it's an unspoken question. And the first word you say is, it's an okapi. And I'm just so interested in how you have invited us as a filmmaker into a really like intimate relationship mm. with what we see and what we hear. Well, <laughs> I got there, sorry. Yes. One of the things that I, um, when I made that film, I was in a moment of introspection. I was in a moment when my, father became really ill in a way that wasn't life-threatening but meant that he couldn't live by himself anymore and so it was this moment of clearing through and moving through this house in a completely new way what I looked at was different how I viewed things how I saw things my gaze felt different because I was a daughter who then became a carer trying to formulate what to take what to save what to have in my father's new place where he was going to live and so the camera almost became the embodiment of my view. And so I, I guess I knew that I wanted to make a film that was about a very emotional space that I found myself in, that was very much about this relationship. But in everything that we do, we take all the politics that are our embodiment with us. And so for me, it was a, an opportunity then to try to have a conversation looking at all these ceramics that we had just lived as a family and considering him as an artist in a completely different way. He had been my dad. He was an art teacher. You know, we had a kiln and a wheel in the garage and he would, 
he would work on things he would paint in the bedroom and my mum would complain about the oil paint smell and so it was a very kind of human way to live art and then I was coming back and looking at these these pieces and suddenly they became something else and so I wanted the camera to somehow see that almost for the first time and start to reveal it to me as much as as to the audience and it, in fact it's it was it's actually the third film I ever made but it was the first film that I made outside of education and so my camera work is incredibly photographic it still is to this day it's kind of the background that I came to filmmaking with but it's something about pacing and it's something about the idea of the frame that's really important to me so in this film I'm very slowly moving with the camera there is movement but there's something that's about stillness that's really important in this film that's a kind of bedding down and being in with me alongside me maybe kind of either connecting to the idea of kind of an empty space or a space that somehow resonates the life of somebody who's moved on in whatever way. And so there's something about the, the camera being my view. And um, I didn't walk quickly because I had to move slowly. I had to work through things. I started to notice things in different ways. I started to notice the emptiness and the lack of or the omission of my father's body. And so the camera came with me on that journey in the hope that then an audience would also, a viewer would come with me in the, in the same way. Um, and I often, often don't follow with the camera actually, so, sort of since this film, following has become much, much less and the camera takes its space and then action comes in or movement happens in and out of the frame. I hope that's an explanation. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's so interesting what you're saying about space because uh, the space is also filled, I mean, the absence of your father is also filled by these ceramics, which become characters in the film. Mm. Um, and they inhabit these extraordinary spaces. Can you look at the next one, Malik? Both sort of interiors and exterior. Yeah, and, and I think there's, there's one more too. And here you actually enter the film yeah. Placing, is it a bear? Yeah, it's a polar bear. Yes, a polar bear. Yeah. And so you have this extraordinary way of taking what is, in fact, a very emotional and intimate relation and sharing it in quite a public way. And it's when we actually see you place this polar bear, we realize the extent of your own creativity and making. You know, the camera is not somehow just this magic eye that a lot of people feel somehow, you know, that there isn't, there isn't an author there. You really are an artist placing yourself in the view along with, so you filled the space with yourself as well as the, the animated ceramics, I think. Yeah. So the, I guess the movement or the strange sighting of the objects as you say, is absolutely the first step of me revealing myself as part of the filmmaking process, because obviously those objects didn't really crawl through windows or, or run in the grass, but they begin to um, work with me to tell the story. So this idea of the inside and the outside climbing through the window, the barriers, the lack of transparency, but also the fake or faded transparency. And then the idea of running for your life through the grass in yeah. particular, situations so the the placement is about enabling me to narrate but then it's also about I've placed them there and it's obvious that I've done that and then as the film progresses I actually move and I think I place and maybe remove the object and that is about my hands it's about my embodiment and I think in almost all of the films if my voice isn't there somehow narrating my body is doing something in order to cite myself both as maker, but as also in relation. Increasingly, the more I make films outside of my own experience, the more important it is that somehow my body is placed and cited within the making of the film and it's visible to the viewer in order for there to be an understanding of my subject position in relation to whoever I'm speaking with or speaking about. Um, and these partial or angled shots of objects, of landscapes, 
buildings, locations, characteristic of your work, and they develop in really interesting ways throughout your films. And the effect is, as you say, to make the audience very aware of the camera shaping and selecting what is seen. So we feel you as a storyteller, mm. as a, not only in terms of the narrative, but as a sort of visual storyteller, constructing. And the view, it makes the viewer work too, I think, because we're involved from a very early stage, piecing together the story that you're telling. It, and stories are not immediately apparent, but they're stories that really need to be told. A history that has to be discovered, that's partial or out of sight, so you have to sort of reveal it, or actually sort of silent. The next clip is actually going to be from uh, The Movable Bridge, which is 2017. So we're moving from Changing Rooms, which is 2014, I think. To 2017. So, can you run this clip for us, Malay? I hear Curry arrived in the 17th century, and I hear the first black sailors were here long before this. I hear that as a port town, everyone is a migrant from somewhere. I hear the passage of spice from the Orient blew through the streets, from ships to tables, from ships to ships, from port to port, on their way to the Americas. I hear that the churches are aplenty and this signifies flux in community. I hear that the docks were places where different faces laughed and fought, loved and died. But the past is always shifting. What we know, what becomes our story, and Hull is no different. Pearson Park was built for the people of Hull to have somewhere beautiful to spend their time off. Away from the harsh existence, cruel seas, exhausting dock life, Pearson was a man who supported the people he owned, his workforce. A conscious decision to look after those with less, but the decision to support the Confederate States in the American Civil War meant that in protecting the needs of the workforce, Hull contributed to the continued enslavement of the black population in the US. Manchester Mills refused to work the cotton from the Americas, while Hull actively supported the machines of plantation life in order to support their own existence. If you aren't seen, you don't see others. I'm interested in this opening up and closing down, in this seeing and unseeing, this hearing and unhearing. Time doesn't seem to matter. There have always been those who are open to the world, community, family, and there are those who block and counterattack. So here we have a city, not, not just a room, although the camera work is often quite similar it moves around the city and the landscapes and mm. pays a lot of careful attention to its textures as well and Hull for an American audience is actually on the east coast of the UK it's situated from the beginning of your film in relation to the world curry you know arrived but it's also the history of migrants and migration and I should also explain to people that, you know, the Hull was actually voted overwhelmingly in favour of Brexit. So for those who are unsure what Brexit is, it was actually a vote for the UK to leave the European Union. So there's this constant paradox that you're interrogating and giving a history, a long history of, of the turning away from the world, of the being open to the world at the same time, of receiving migrants, but of also of the rage of, of racism and uh, anti-migrant campaigns and activities. And that, you know, this contradiction here too about caring for one set of workers while actually not caring for those on the plantations who are sort of, you know, supporting the work. So it seems as if the character of Zachariah Pearson, Peterson? Pearson, yeah, Pearson. Embodies many of those sort of, you know, contradictions, but it becomes a contradiction of the city too. It's mm -hmm. people and the city. 
as sort of in this inextricable. So can you talk about you're interested in what you say, the opening and the closing down, the hearing, the unhearing, and the seeing and the unseeing, and how you've so beautifully, you know, embodied this in film. I mean, I think probably thematically across all my films, I'm interested in the idea of opening up and closing down, the idea of forced and unforced migration, the idea of the kind of colonial structures which are global, but I obviously, I well, not obviously, but I often talk about in relation to the, the UK, because it's this kind of story, I would say embodies British politics internally and externally. And so I guess that's the comparison in this particular film that I'm trying to make um, between the divisive nature of capital. Um, so it's a, a businessman who, can only see his workforce as a commodity. So in the kind of paternalistic class system that the UK has perpetuated for, for centuries, really, if you're going to think about it in kind of more sort of open terms in terms of the class system, it's a way of dividing. It's a way of rule and divide. And it's, a, it's exactly what happens and is happening, I think, globally, but particularly in the UK at the moment. That's what happened with the Brexit vote, the kinds of undermining of working class populations to the point at which they believe everything you're going to offer them and look for somebody else to blame. And I always look, I guess, in terms of histories rather than singular histories. I think of them as multiple. I don't ever think of histories as, as linear. They're always cyclical. And so for me, this was an example, another example of the cyclical nature of duping or conning or trying to control, I guess, manipulating a kind of uh, collective understanding of a situation. And, and if I felt so kind of shocked by what happened with Brexit, although not un unshocked in many ways, but the kind of the shock of it for the country as a whole, it resonated. Once I got into that archive in Hull, I could see exactly what was happening. And, you know, there are moments that in the film look at Mosley going to do a talk and how uh, black sailors suddenly being attacked and then being tried to be convicted of murder when they're trying to defend themselves. And, you know, there was the First World War, then all, all the black seamen who had, whether they were part of the forces or whether they were working on some of the commercial ships that were supporting the, the actions and the, the kind of transference of food were then all sent away. So there are these moments in Hull, because it's a port town, that respond directly to political moments and also situations of war, where this cycle happens time and time and time again. And Brexit was the next one. And I we were right in it. It had just happened. And so it felt really important to try and have a conversation about those cycles that, that are so powerful, so, so powerful in the UK in terms of how things are done. Mm. And you have a strong, a sense of place as of the people. I mean, they are so beautifully integrated, um, you know, in, in the, your films. We have one more clip actually I'm going to ask you to run Malik could you just pause there just a minute so just before we run the clip this is an extraordinary extraordinarily beautiful image beautiful um, yeah. I just want people to think about how beautiful it is but also how it reveals a real enigma and paradox as the film runs can you play it for us then Siemens ask you not to vote for Brexit, and you do it anyway. Jobs and hope, future plans, economy, wind farm, European investment. What happened? The docks, the life of the port, has always been contested ground. Lives fractured, fluctuating from one tragedy to another, death at sea. And now people are coming close, running from great pain, and from threat of death on sea and on land, and you have closed the doors. You have pulled in again and said the port is closed. We are closed. And I'm trying to make sense of this, because when I walk the streets, I feel cresting, troughing, tidal warmth, and I don't understand where the line of welcome 
fishing net strength has been severed. I don't understand what has happened. So what is quite extraordinary is that, so we see the scene and we think we're immediately struck I by- I do ask the question. Oh, just, uh, just one second. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to sort of stop you in the middle. It's fine, it was just finishing anyway. Yeah, but, um, but at the same time, you have a scene where the horizon is obscured. You, we realize that actually this scene embodies exactly all the sort of contradictions that you've been trying to talk about. The docks apparently open to the horizon, but we can't quite see it. It opens to the world, but actually, you know, they're surrounded in this mist, but that's also a dilemma for you because you're talking about how you don't understand mm. how there are some, and I wonder if it's an extraordinarily powerful way, I think, of really pointing to the limits of, of how we can really comprehend what seems to be, there is no easy explanation. And you, you represent the complexity and all its richness, I mm. think that is just really captured by that image and the, I, relation, the relation to the text, image and text. Because there's something about, I can't remember, I was doing an interview and somebody was saying, you know, do you feel hopeful? And I said, well, some days I feel hopeful and other days I don't feel hopeful. And that makes complete sense. That, that seems like sanity to me because there is something about how we navigate situations and how we understand them for ourselves. And it is complicated and it is complex. And my sense of hope is about the fact that I want to have conversations. And in order to have those conversations, you have to be able to ask questions and be able to be prepared to hear answers that you may maybe don't want to hear. And so this is also something that runs through film work and print work for me is this idea of dialogue. And I don't want to be somebody who tells a story that's a closed story. So it always has to contain ideas of questioning and unstable ground. You know, life is unstable. Emotionally, it's unstable. Structurally, it's unstable, even though sometimes we feel so tied in. But actually, everything can shift and change. And so because I'm interested in ideas of change and activating change, the only way that makes sense to me is to be open enough and to try and question what closes down, when it closes down, why it closes down, who does the closing, who does the opening and how that happens. And so, I, yeah, I would say every film tries to contain that. And I came and I sat and it had been pouring with rain and the sun just came out and all of that, it's a combination of steam and it kind of industrial mist as well yeah. as steam mist. And it's all of that, you know, combined into this beautiful vista that we talked about. It feels like it could be a kind of 19th century, 18th, 19th century painting. Oh yeah, <laughs> a turner, no doubt. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just so interesting in terms of what you were saying about Britain. You know, he's thought to be the sort of British artist or whatever, but this is a, this is a paradoxical and contradictory and class driven as well as racism mm. yeah. driven portrait. And you also leave us with this sort of sense that you met incredible warmth, mm. you yes. know, but you were meeting incredible warmth from people who were also shutting out the rest of the world. So it's, you leave us with that. These are questions for us mm. as well as, as you. Um, could we go to the next slide, Manny, please? So this is actually just a still. And this is from Concrete Feathers and Porcelain Tax. So we've moved now to 2021, actually. Yeah. It's quite a leap. <laughs> um, but what struck me is this, is this is the history of another city. This is Rochdale. Mm -hmm. It's a town of mills and textile industry. It's another industrial space. But unlike in Movable Bridge, Rochdale is actually the home of the cooperative movement. And I think you also tell the story of how Manchester textile industry refused to use the cotton produced by the enslaved. I think you tell that story yeah. in Movable Bridge. 
And in the film, there's a strong sense of community, um, multiple individual people, communal events and voices with whom you're in dialogue. But then you also have these extraordinary portraits of objects, sometimes of labor. This is, you know, obviously this is a sewing machine. And in the film, you actually show a seamstress stitching by a lake. And then the next still, Malik, this is Paul Robeson, but as an object, a human, as a, a, you know, as an object, a sculpture. And then this next one, there's this portrait of another person with this extraordinary background and texture. Mm. So how, I'm just interested in this relation between this placement of objects, just as you were doing in, in changing room and, and the sort of placement of people. When you were talking about stillness, we do experience that through these incredible moments, um, evocative moments, the mm. way you use objects. Can you talk about that, the relation between objects and people? Yes, because I suppose there's something about there's something about the idea that an object represents so much more than its form that for me they can't really be divorced the idea of form and what they mean in terms of a social context or an emotional context so this idea of form is really interesting to me and with this particular project there was a so I was kind of given a brief to somehow work with this museum and with a community in Rochdale different communities or whoever I wanted to work with and the museum itself has both an art collection and uh, a collection of objects and artifacts that mostly relate to Rochdale as a, a kind of industrial town in the north. And so when I started to talk with people in the community, I decided to use the, the, the collection as a way to begin conversations. So I would maybe start with, um, I mean, we initially were planning to have different groups to come to the collection to select objects and items and then COVID hit. And so we couldn't do that. So I went to the collection and I took as many objects that I thought would stimulate different kinds of conversations that related to community, that related to connectedness, that related to the industrial centre of the North Manchester. And then different groups selected from this number of objects we we had them all photographed and we started to have conversations and people started to say oh my my great grandmother had that exact same sewing machine in iran and started to talk about what that meant and then somebody else was like oh my granny down the road in rochdale also had one of those it was a slightly different model and so before we knew it we were having conversations that were globally about community they were about family they were about gender they were about race um, and so the objects became um they became these entities that we kind of moved around between us and people passed between themselves in having these conversations. And we were, do, we were doing at one point like eight workshops online a week in the run up to then when things opened up, having a, a kind of really solid different groups of probably eight or nine different groups of people who wanted to participate in the film. And then we decided where we were going to cite the objects together as well. So the conversation happened, it was a catalyst for conversation and dialogue it opened up different environments geographically across Rochdale when people were saying oh I know that sewing machine's so beautiful it's got all those leaves on it let's take it to the Dell so then we went to the Dell and then it's another okay so, yeah so it was about this kind of matrices of conversations that happened and the objects were um something that were more than just their form I suppose um yeah well, I didn't realise they were collectively cited. That's just, it. that's, that's yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Were you invited to do Rochdale because of Moving Bridge? I mean, did people think? I was invited to make that. Portrait of Hull, so why not of <laughs> Rochdale? I, think, I mean, I think I was invited because I had done, I mean, I think what I've done is I've moved around geographically and sometimes it's in direct relation to myself. So when I went to, although I, my family are not from Barbados, I was having a conversation about the Caribbean and 
that was 2016 with a couple of films that kind of moved around and, and looked at the sugar industry. Then I was invited to go to Derry to make The Long Note, which was, again, this was outside of my life experience. And, you know, initially I, I rejected the kind of the commission because I said I didn't think I was the right person to make it. But having a dialogue with the curator who convinced me. So I think it's on the back of being able to almost navigate different geographical spaces, different political and social spaces. And so having done the long note in Northern Ireland and movable bridge in Hull, I think Film and Video Umbrella wanted to invite me to do it again and think about using an archive. So each of the films that I've talked about have used different kinds of archives, historical archives, film archives, as well as working with, with live human beings, which I think of as live archives. So yeah. I think, yes, you're right. It's you all so you mentioned the Caribbean and I was thinking there's a hole in the sky, parts one and two. Those mm -hmm. are two of the films actually up for people to, to see from the British Arts Centre. It'll most probably be our last clip, but um, can we see the next clip? And you said, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. When people still run to exist, when running is so costly. Hatred supported by our nation state. Guns supported by US states. Policies supported by European states. Wars supported by global states. Legitimised, fabricated, fooled. Fooled. Fools. Dangerously foolish. Living in the fear of fear. So, hate, behind that brutal history, you also reveal sugar and the history of sugar and then the involvement of the state and corporations in this exploitation in extraordinarily powerful ways. So there's a way in which you know, going to the Caribbean both is a thread that comes down from the film you made about your father, but it was also an incredibly powerful evocation of the global forces mm. at work here in the history and, of course, and then also in the profits that went to Britain. So can you just talk a little bit about how hate became this sort of central question here that involves so many of these global and individual forces and how they all coalesce around sugar? Mm. Well, I, I mean, obviously that's James Baldwin talking about hate. And I, it's something that is, uh, something that is utilized and has been utilized historically in order to divide people and in order for to other people. So to disappear people or to somehow undermine them to the extent that they become subhuman. And so both of those films are kind of meanderings around this idea of belonging and unbelonging and what that means, being sighted and being invisible and what that means. It's about whether there is value or worth to your place or your position or your opinion or your contribution. So it also looks at the second film, part two, looks at the Nicholas brothers, but also as James Baldwin, as somebody who fled to Europe, so left the US in order to try to actually work, live, be recognised and acknowledged for who they are, but also what they did. So there's this conversation that sort of flurries around, I suppose, different ideas of migration and how migration is forced, so on the plantation, and how it is potentially seen to be a choice, but people are forced into making choices also in terms of survival. So it part two looks at migration in many different ways. So the idea of being a migrant or a refugee, but it's also about this notion of needing to live somewhere else in order to fulfill your potential and be able to do the things and say the things that you feel you want to do and say in the world. 
And that is a privilege to be in a position where you can do that. And so I want to somehow draw that out in this, in both of those films as well. So it kind of moves around. It looks at the responsibility of libraries, the responsibility of writers. So it's not just about the idea of people and capital. It's also about the idea of the structures in place, who writes the histories, what is noted and why it's noted, who is seen as um, important in certain situations or moments in histories and time. So, yeah, I, I don't... And as a filmmaker, you situate yourself in relation to those libraries and those archives and the mythologies they contain, yes. which is also a sort of a dilemma for you because you talk that, that you know, you talk about how they're safe spaces but also how they're brutal and they actually, and that's, yeah. So do you, there's one, you talked about James Baldwin, but you also sort of evoke Nina Simone in, in an earlier film, Movable Bridge, I think. And she talks about the duty of the artist. Yeah. And uh, is that something that you're feeling from her, that you feel you inherit from her, that the duty of the artist is to actually talk about, in a way, present dangers. Mm. I, you know what? I believe, <laughs> I believe that we all have that, that we all have the responsibility to reflect the times. Like, that's exactly what she's saying. She doesn't understand this notion that you would be an artist and not reflect the times. And I suppose I often say the same thing about artists who say, yeah, but I'm not a political artist. Everything we do, we say, we make is political because if we're making a choice for it not to appear to be political, that is also a political choice. So I, I guess I would say that that notion first came to me as a child from my dad, this real kind of um, sense of responsibility to other people and to the place that I live, wherever that is, whenever that is. You know, I have a stake and that actually with the stake that I have, I can do something with that. The thing that I do doesn't have to be, be a politician. I don't have to be a teacher. I don't have to be a writer. I can do whatever I want to do in that. But in some ways, I know in doing that, it reflects the times in which I live. I and totally agree with you. I mean, yeah. as a teacher <laughs> too, I feel that responsibility, but yeah. I really should just look at um, a question here. Um, is that okay? Just yeah. to think about a question. The first one from an anonymous attendee. Your films are stunning and very powerful. Music can be a powerful vehicle for expression in film, yet these films don't appear to have any music. Well, actually, they do, yours. They have <laughs> you singing. I assume this is a conscious decision. Could you talk about that decision to exclude music? Mm. So, um... Thank you for being so generous and kind. Um, um, yet nearly every film I make has got music in some way. I think Changing Room is the only film I think that doesn't have music. And I think at that point, I hadn't really engaged with music and song in the way that I, I have in every other film that I make. So Movable Bridge has not me singing. Uh, no, actually, it does have me singing. So the House Martins are a really well-known band from Hull, and they wrote a very incredibly political and poignant and cyclical, like it's it's kind of on the money for now, song, um, which I then re-sing, and it's part of the soundtrack, and it's sung alongside all the adverts that went out um, when Brexit was happening, when all the kind of campaigning was happening. So there's that, and there's some folk music as well that came out of Hull that kind of ends the film alongside Philip, a Philip Larkin poem. So I do use music a lot, but it's usually used not as a kind of soundtrack, but almost as a, as a part of the text, a part of the script, a part of the narrative. So in Hole in the Sky part one, there's this section that I wrote, which is, was about some of the experiments that were done to black babies on plantations. And instead of saying it, I sing it and I sing it in a particular way. And there's something about the way I deliver something. The meaning might change when I sing something, but it's also how something quite difficult to be heard can be received if it's in song. There's something about it touching you in a different place. So I completely agree about the idea of music and sound, but I make a very conscious decision not to use it as soundtrack, 
but to use it as, um, I guess, a device of voice. So I'm interested in the different registers of the voice. So it moves from poetic voice to sung voice. So when I do performances, they're usually spoken and sung word and I'll weave in, I might, there's a poem from Langston Hughes called Evil, which is in one of my performances. And instead of speaking it as a poem, I sing it and it becomes a kind of crescendo at the end of the, of the performance. So yeah, song and music is absolutely part of how I work in performance and in film, but not a soundtrack. Should I ask Malik to bring back the presentation and play that next clip um, that we have lined up, just to hear the song again? Drilling into brain, black babies can't feel. 500 lashes, cause black skin don't peel. How can this be gone? Sting, sting, real. Yes, how can this be gone? Sting, sting, real. Drilling into brain, black babies can't feel. 500 lashes, cause black skin don't peel. How can this be gone? Sting, sting, real. Yes, how can this be gone? Sting, sting, real. I just thought as you'd been talking about that scene, we've been thinking about sound, that playing it um, would be great for people to hear. How did you decide, you were talking about the cadence and how you interpreted that? I mean, do you sing a lot in well, the performances that accompany the film? I used to, as a teenager, I used to sing and I probably at some point imagined I was going to really sing well and be a singer. And um, but it didn't, I, you know, I I went to university. I, I started singing when I was about 14 in like in folk clubs because I was in the middle of the countryside and there was nothing to do. And my mum was desperate and took me to a folk club. And so I started performing and that's what I did for my pocket money or my, you know, my job until I went to university. And actually, then I became a social worker and I did that for 10 years and I did less and less and less music. And then but it's always been part of who I am, this mm. kind of bursting into song and singing things. You know, it took me a long time to learn to read and I used to sing books to try to retain the text and the stories. Um, my poor brother, I used to force him to listen to me singing stories. Um, so it's always been this really important way of using the voice in my life. And then when I went to, um, I think probably when I went to Italy for the Max Mara residency, where I had some singing lessons, which was, you know, later than this. And I learned to sing a pre-opera lament. And I did that as a duet with a jazz trumpeter. And we, you know, we made a vinyl. And so now music is part of nearly every project, whether it's performance or whether it's in films, but um, yeah. And, and when you and have exhibitions, you often have performances, right? Yeah. Do in the, yeah. 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 So we just, you know, the, the one at Serpentine, which was me making a radio ballad, this idea of, a kind of magazine film or project that uh, represented the voices of social workers. And my interpretation of that was social workers and those who access the services provided by those social workers. And we, we through workshops, wrote a song and then we performed that on the, on the opening night of the, of the exhibition. So it was, you know, women from Barking and Dagenham who had never performed before in their lives who then came and sang in front of an audience of 400. I mean, it was quite an amazing night. Well, I was going to say, I wish I'd seen that. Yeah. I wish I'd seen that. Okay, one other question. What are the artists or filmmakers, living or dead, <laughs> had an influence on your work and why? <laughs> okay. You know, I think mostly I'm really drawn to writers. When I talk about being inspired it's usually by writers so you know James Baldwin, Audre Lord, and musicians so Nina Simone. Um, in terms of film this is going to set maybe sound strange but one of the filmmakers who really had an impact on me is 
Krzysztof Kislowski, who is a Polish documentary filmmaker who, it was the first time I'd really seen documentary films that are unscripted, that just tread a really interesting line between a narrative film and a documentary film. And he worked with people who hadn't acted before. And I'm very, very interested and inspired by the way that he works with people and how he uses the camera. So Krzysztof Kozlowski, yeah, is probably the filmmaker that I say I began and became most inspired by. <laughs> um, uh, Akwasi Sapong asks, if you have any plans to work with creatives, and she says writers, visual artists, poets, filmmakers, in Ghana. In Ghana? In Ghana. I don't have any plans to. <laughs> <laughs> maybe no, she I, can, maybe I she can invite you. Yes, maybe. That would be good. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in not moving around the world as a kind of artistic global tourist, you know, but I am interested in the kinds of connects that we can make as artists, writers, musicians, people you know and so there is something interesting for me and at the moment I you know I've I spent the whole of January in New Orleans and then I went back again for another two weeks and I'm going to go back again later in the year because I have a project there with Rivers Institute and and there's something about the connects that fall into place once you allow yourself to really be in a place and be open and be honest and be vulnerable the kinds of connections that you make with with other people are kind of quite incredible and are they are the makings of ideas and something new happening so yeah I don't know but I don't have a plan to but it would be very interesting. So uh, just in our last five minutes I just wanted to reference the other film that is up on the British Arts Centre website that can be streamed which is they call it Idlewild and uh, it's a very complex film and we can't do it justice, but it's a wonderful venture into the, the contradictory politics, I guess, of, of idleness. Mm. Because some people get to be idle and in terms of wealth and privilege, and other people um, in terms of forced labor, thinking you have the the song I was thinking about it because of the song you have the song lazy bones you have music in this film so you know those actually relating to forced labor those who are accused of being idle so we also you know <laughs> this pandemic has sort of forced a lot of isolation and at the beginning you talked about the importance of stillness and space so the question I would have in relation, I think, to that film is, um, to what extent is idleness or the stillness that can come really important for creativity, for thinking? You know, I was thinking during the pandemic, there were those who sort of went into isolation and then there were also those who were designated essential workers and they couldn't go. You know, they were cleaning hospital floors and in the health center, and they were, you know, providing sort of transport. But another way to think about it, you suggest, is also as a space to breathe, as essential for creativity. Yeah, I think, and the activeness of making that choice to be idle is, I mean, I found myself, that, that film came out of a place where I had been the busiest I think I've ever been in my entire life. The, the whole Turner Prize machine had been happening. I'd been working on maybe five or six projects all at one go, trying to balance everything. And I was offered this residency with the idea that I was gonna make a film working with their archive in response to the 30th anniversary of the, the institution, the artist studios and the, the gallery space there. And, um, and you know, I just sat in this room, in this loft, and I couldn't, I couldn't. My head was so busy and I felt so busy that I couldn't do anything. And then I was like, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? And then the next day, so I went to bed and the next day I sat again in the office thinking, right, okay, there are things in this archive that I will be interested in. But actually what I wanted to do 
was to breathe and stare out of the window. And all I could see were these kind of glowing autumn trees and they were blowing in the wind and they changed in the light as I sat there for the whole day. And I just started to write. And I hadn't found myself in a situation like that probably ever where there was silence, there was no one around. I was in this tiny little loft in this building that was in this grounds of this kind of rural art center. And I just heard the birds and I heard the sound of cars on the road, but there weren't, um, there weren't very many communications that were coming from my mouth or somebody else's. And there weren't many other bodies around. And I just breathed, I had this moment to breathe. And as soon as I breathed, I just didn't stop writing for days. And then I was able to somehow weave that into a story that was about this idea of who gets to be idle, who gets to breathe, who gets to take that space. And then once you start thinking about that, you start thinking about the relationship between sitting, stillness, doing nothing and laziness and idleness. Who is perceived to be lazy? Who's allowed to be? Who do we think is? And then, of course, you start running into the politics of value and worth, whether that's about class or gender or race. And so the story just kind of led itself. And, um, and yeah, so there's, you know, Jonathan Crary's talking about the sleepless soldiers um, mm. that have been kind of trialed in the States. There are references to birds who don't sleep, who are being used as a way to understand how you can make soldiers not sleep. There are the politics of um, right wing politics, which promise and tell you that certain people are lazy while others are not. Um, yeah. yeah, or a burden. And yet those are the people who are up at three in the morning cleaning toilets. Cleaning for toilet, you. Right, right. And driving the buses. I know. So, Helen, it is, just remains for me to say thank you. This is quite extraordinary. And also to say to the audience, if you haven't actually yet watched the films available to you on the British Arts Centre, please do. And please pursue all of Helen's other films. They are absolutely remarkable and incredibly important. So, Helen, thank you for your generosity. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>